Hey everybody, how's it going? Dan Schender here on Drum Talk TV with today's guest for a second hazing er, experience, Liberty DeVito. We're, I'm so excited we're gonna talk about Liberty's book that we debuted, uh, gosh, that had to be around a year ago or so, and I've read it since and I've got some questions. We're gonna talk about that. I'm in Globe, Arizona, 100 miles east of Phoenix up in the mountains where it's a little cooler. Liberty, welcome, how are you? And you're in Brooklyn? I'm good. I'm in Brooklyn. I wouldn't wear the hat if I was. Yeah, his his <laughs> wife <laughs> makes him wear the hat in case he gets lost. He just looks at his hat. <laughs> I, that's all I do. Just look up and, and, hey, you must be from Brooklyn. Yeah, I, I am. Thank you for telling me. Sometimes, you know, I wear a hat all the time. And sometimes somebody says something about the hat, and I have to think, what hat do I have on today? You know? <laughs> somebody looks at me and goes, Yankees, yeah. And I go, what hat am I wearing? <laughs> <laughs> that's great. How have you been, man? I've been good. I've been good. I mean, uh, you know, things are starting to lighten up a bit with the pandemic and yeah. hopefully it won't come back. And right. um, I think it's going to be like a yearly thing. You get a shot like the flu. Yeah. Uh, who knows? But uh, we're starting to play again. Good. We're getting out there. You know, Lords of 52nd uh, Street. Lords of 52nd Street. Slim Kings have been in the studio just writing songs and uh, just doing it. You know, That's awesome. it's good to be back. Good. You know? Let's talk about the wonderful book you put out through Hudson Music, our friends at Hudson, Rob Wallace. Um, wh one of the things I love, I'm going to kind of skip around. I love that there's a chapter dedicated to groupies. And you point out that there's such a important, and I think we can even use the word integral part, to the rock and roll culture and the music scene that you decided to dedicate um, a chapter to groupies and you you tell some great stories with what without giving away too much of course we want people to buy the book which you can get at hudsonmusic.com but let's let's talk about some anecdotes you have in the book starting with groupies what would be the funniest thing that either happened to you or that you know of happened to someone in the biz that had to do with a groupie and it's kind of a family show so you know whatever you can get away oh, with well, that makes it uh, difficult to talk about the groupies. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, uh, like I say in the book, the, everybody thinks that the female groupies are crazy, but the male groupies are worse because yeah. they're, they're not there for the, you know, the, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's they're, more the fanboy element, right? Yeah, yeah. And they become uh, obsessed of uh, for whatever reason. I mean, I, I know that when I met Paul McCartney, I was kind of crazy. And if I wasn't the drummer that was going to play on the recordings we were about to do, I probably would have been a fanboy, you know. Yeah. But I've also seen uh, friends, close friends, um, uh, turn into the fanboy when I bring them to a rehearsal or something with Billy Joel. You know, all of a sudden they become this different person. It's like, dude, what happened to you? Yeah. You know, yeah. get yourself together. Yeah, hold yourself. <laughs> Get a grip. <laughs> and it's really amazing to watch, you know, you know yeah. the transition from like, yeah, oh, yeah, I'll go to rehearsal. Well, yeah, it'd be great. It'd be great. Oh, my God, that's Billy Joel. <laughs> now, well, when did you think you were going? <laughs> you know, I, I heard something I, I think is so genius uh, years ago when I first started Drum Talk TV. And I was having a conversation with someone. And uh, they said, you know, you you treat people like rock stars and rock stars like people. You know, we we really all and you've traveled around the world. I've I've been to many different countries. And if there's one thing I've learned, and I'd love your perspective on this, people of different races mm -hmm. and cultures and religions and all these different we all really want the same thing, right? We all we all want to be happy. Yep. And I think happiness pretty much means the same thing. We want our children to be safe get some sort of decent level of education and, you know, all these things. And if that's the case, Liberty, why can't we get there? Why is this you know, such a stretch? Yeah, I told somebody once and, and, he, and he quoted me uh, years later and I said something I, and I said, you know, it, it, it's nice to be liked for what you do, but it's better to be loved for who you are. Yeah. You know, so it, it's really cool. You know, people like you because, you know, you play the drum group Billy Joel, but uh, they really don't know you. They think they do. Right. And, you know, on, on Facebook, you, uh, they call me Lib. Nobody, unless you, you're my friend and I've known you for a little while, you know, they call me Lib. <laughs> yes. When I see these fans call me Lib, 
It's like, whoa, I don't even know who you are or what you look like. Right. You know? You're right. calling me Lib. And, uh, you know, they, they, when you had friends when you were growing up, before there was any internet and any Facebook and anything like that, I mean, they were your friends. You could depend on them and, you know, say something wrong to these friends on Facebook that they don't agree with. And they're all over you. to rail like, you. Oh, like, yeah. God. Yeah. You know, people need to lighten it's, up. It's funny, though, because, because uh, making comments on Facebook, sometimes I can't help myself. You know, it's yeah. like uh, I, I feel like uh, if I don't say something, I don't want to get to the point where something happens that I wish I did say something at the time. Yeah. So I, I got a big mouth sometimes when it, I get pushed to a point. Where From like Brooklyn? I have to say something. I've never heard that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, and, and the greatest thing is that when I say something that people don't agree with, I get to see that uh, I'm still appreci appreciated as a drummer. And the reason why is because if I say something politically and they disagree with it, yeah, they're like, why don't you just shut your mouth, stay out of politics and just play the drums because that's the only thing you're good at. <laughs> okay, well, so good at the drums. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, people. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I, I know people want us to close the loop on the groupie story. So go ahead and tell one funny story. Go ahead. Let's push the envelope a little bit. It's okay. Well, well, uh, it, you know, different things have happened with, with, with groupies. Uh, there was, how can I say it with in a family show? I mean, <laughs> go ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll censor the archive. This, let, let's go with the, the male groupies. Okay. The, the, like, like the story about the guy that, that, wanted to come backstage uh, and uh, he was in um, uh, Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. Then he wanted to come backstage and he's talking to me again, like I'm um, his buddy, like, hey, Liv, it's great. I'm mean, going to come into Louisville, come backstage. And this is when we're on tour with Billy and Elton, the, the two of them, right? Right. And uh, so this guy uh, uh, starts sending me these gifts. He, he sees our itinerary, he's sending me... I, I, I didn't drink at the time, but he sent me Kentucky whiskey all everywhere we're going. He sent it to me, <laughs> sent it to Nigel Olson and Dee Murray, you know, all of us. And I'm telling this guy via uh, internet, uh, there's no backstage. Uh, Billy and Elton, because it's both of them, they, there's no backstage. You know, cause I'm trying to, I don't know. I'm yeah. not going to give him a backstage pass. I don't know who he is. So he goes, I'm going to send a big spread of uh uh, bagels and locks uh, to the gig uh, in Kentucky. And then oh, it would be great to go backstage and hang with you guys. And other. I said, no, don't do that. We get to the gig, big spread <laughs> bagel and locks. You know, big, like two tables full. Wow. Show, show time comes. I don't leave him any passes or nothing like that, you know. The next day I wake up, I get on the, on the internet and there's a, a note from him. And the funny thing is, it said it starts, dear Lib. Then it gets into this. I, I can't tell you on this show what he said, but it had to do with with anatomy of Satan. Um, oh wow! Look over your. It's so bad that our security guy called the police, and the police went to his place of work and told him. This is an absolute threat. This is stalking, you know? basically, too, right? Yeah. Look over your shoulder. You never know when I'm going to be there. I'm wow. going to get even with you. Yeah. After you told him to stop. No. I kept saying no. Right. Wow. So, crazy. yeah, that, those groupies are crazy. Uh, female groupies, they're, they're there for the fun. Yeah. You know? Uh, and like you, you know, say in the book, sometimes it just genuinely meet the band, you know, just meet you, you know, there's right. the different levels of, of groupies, you know, you see, and then, and then, you know, like you're, you're in a bar, you're having a couple of cocktails with the, with the boys and a girl comes up to you and says, Oh, you know, I just want to say that I love your music and, and you guys are really great. I've seen you at the Enormo Dome down the block and, and it was a fantastic show. And then all of a sudden her boyfriend is pissed because she's talking to us. <laughs> And then a fight breaks out. It's like, oh, what? What's wrong with you, guy? Yeah, he's just talking to us. Yeah, you know. Well, jealousy comes out of insecurity, and there's a lot of that out there. You know. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Um, one of the things I, I love about the book, and and folks, 
if you are into learning from people's experiences, this really is a great read because Liberty, you you cover um, not only the song by song making of all the albums with Billy Joel, but really mm. your life story, your upbringing, your immigrant parents, you know, there's, it's, and, and the rest of your family, your uncle Liberty, there's really some great stuff in here. And I love biographies and documentaries yeah. like that. And this book <clears throat> fits right in. The other thing I love about it, and this is, um, I got to turn to a couple pages here. I do appreciate so much the fact that you've got lots of photos in here. Yeah. Great photos. And, and there's a story behind every photo. You know, the one there with Paul McCartney. And, um, you know, talk about, uh, where was it? Where was it? I got to find this. Oh, I marked it. <laughs> I got to find this other photo. People will definitely appreciate this if they're Drum Talk TV fans. You know, we, we used a term a little bit ago. Where is it? Sorry. Hold on one second. There we go. Talk, talk about big mouths from Brooklyn. There's our friend Carmine Apiece. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I've known Carmine since I was 16 years old. Yeah. You know, uh, we became immediate friends. And, and like I say in the book, if it wasn't for Vinnie Martell from the same band, the Vanilla Fudge, he was the, the one that actually set me on my path, you know, he, yeah. We were jamming. I was like 18 years old when Mitch Ryder, uh, his tour manager, came to um, the office and, and they were looking for a drummer because uh, Johnny B was leaving. Yeah. You know, so it was Vinny that that I was playing with him. They heard me and it was like, OK. And then once I had that name, when I played with Mitch, once I had that name, everybody, you know, in the 60s knew who Mitch was. Yeah. And even you know, to the 70s. When, when Billy said, well, who do you play with? And I would say, this guy, that guy, this guy. And then I said, yeah, and I, and I played with Mitch Ryder. You played with Mitch Ryder? Yeah, I did. Oh, great. That's good. That's great. Okay, good. <laughs> you know, I remember once Billy saying to me, uh, before we started playing, we recorded Turnstiles first, and then we went on tour. Yeah. So he, he says, um, have you ever played in a, in a big play? And then he went, oh, that's right. You play with Mitch, Mitch Ryder. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. You know, a lot of people don't know this, but Carmine, like when you see Carmine play on stage, he's actually miming, and it's his brother Vinny playing under the stage that you hear. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Carmine's been such a great friend and supporter of, of the show. Who are some of the greats that you grew up? going to see when you were younger and becoming, you know, musician, playing drums and some of the people that influenced you. Let's go there. Well, my mother, uh, she, she encouraged me to play the drums. You know, it's uh, later on in, in life when I, when I asked uh, my father, like, why did you buy me drums? Because I always loved music, but I didn't love any particular instrument, you know. And he said, because they didn't make Prozac when you were a kid, so we bought you a set of drums. <laughs> <laughs> so, That'd so, be a um, great name for a drum brand, wouldn't it? <laughs> Prozac. Prozac <laughs> drums. <laughs> Get a grip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so my mom, uh, she loved, um, she used to go out and see Gene Krupa play, you know. Oh, uh, wow. She used to cut school to see Sinatra, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. And um, so she was very encouraging in, in me learning how to play drums. Now, I didn't take the drum seriously until the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan show, like every other kid in the world. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, um, that that's when I uh, started to think like, OK, I, I, I'd like to do that. I think I think I can do that, you know. And um, but along the way, the things, you know, you have a style, you end up with a style because of who you are, yeah. where you come from. Right. And who your influence is what. Exactly. You know, that, that's why I wrote the book, because it's like, where did I come from? Where did I grow up? How was my childhood like? Yeah. And who were my influences that got me to really appreciate music? So Ringo would be the first. And my mom would be the first with Gene Krupa. Yeah. You know, everybody, everybody loves Buddy Rich, but Gene Krupa was, was our guy. Then Ringo. Then Dino Dinelli. Oh, Yeah. Uh, and the Rascals. Yeah. Now, I can remember the first time I went to see the Rascals, I was probably 16, maybe maybe 17. And uh, um, we went to see the Birds 
with uh, Roger McGuinn uh, mm-hmm. were the headliners. The Rascals were opening up for the birds. And we went, and it was the first time that I saw a drummer be such a, a, a focal point as much as a lead singer. You know, he was an act in himself. Yeah. They all were. All, all four of them were, were an act in themselves. But he was like, oh, my God, I can't take my eyes off this guy. You know, so yeah. that really, like, put me over the top You know, as I, far as visual I, goes. I wonder if he was a huge Gene Krupa fan, because I think Gene Krupa might, it's fair to say, he might be the first rock star drummer, because he was yeah. so flamboyant in the way he played and everything, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and was such a focal point. Um, that's yeah. interesting. And, and do you have contemporary artists that have come on the scene in the last 10, 15 years that you admire or think they're doing something different? And I know that's hard to say because there's not there's not a lot of people in the last 50 years that have done something different, different. Um, and that's okay. You know, everything comes from something else and morphs and changes. But are there any... Um, more contemporary drummers that have caught your eye and ears. Yeah, um, you know, I, 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 there's a lot of drummers that that I watch, and as far as a learning thing goes, learning from them, I sometimes learn what I'm never going to do, and I go like, okay, I'm never going to do that. You know, <laughs> so I, I love that. Like um, uh, Antonio Sanchez is as uh, you know the soundtrack to Bird, and then he um, uh, played on this. Uh, uh, the the TV version of Get Shorty, yeah, with, uh, with Ray Romano was was in it, right? And um, it was just drums. It's just drums, and and it's funny because I, I was watching it one night, and I told my wife, I said, "This is these drums are incredible." So at the end, I saw his name, and I, I found him on Facebook, and I wrote to him, and I said, "I'm watching uh, the Get Shorty series, and and your drumming is incredible." He wrote me back and he says, thank you, Liberty. Um, I just want to tell you, I saw you play in Mexico City a long time ago. Oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> nice. One of the other things you cover in the book, um, and it's such an odd time to talk about this, I remember seeing the documentary when you guys went to Russia. Mm. And I loved that. And my parents were first-generation born Americans my grandparents were Russian, but f- were born in Ukraine. So imagine, yeah. you know, what's going on in, in in my mind right now in Kiev and Odessa is where my grandparents were from, but they were Russian. So when I saw the documentary of you guys in Russia and the food and just the seeing experience, I wanted to go to Russia so badly. Um, we named our our eight month old puppy Sasha Savelli, which is a Russian male name and now a few months later all this is going on and it's just so heartbreaking yeah. but what was it like back then in 86 when you actually went there for the first time that must have been in a lot of ways even though we said earlier everyone wants the same thing for happiness and their kids and whatnot but was it like being on a different planet in some ways or was it the same but just different architecture and language you know it's funny you talk about your dog and your name is sasha when I came home, we got a dog for the my daughters, uh, and uh, we named it Kuzia. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, one of my daughters was born uh, pretty close to, uh, she was born in 88. I think we went to Russia in 86 or something like that. Yeah. And Ele- Elena was one of the names we were going to name her because we met a woman there. She was our guide that we just fell in love with. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, going to the Soviet Union now, when you think of another superpower, right? Like you're always told that they're the other superpower, and yeah. you think you're going to see something equivalent to where you live, because we're considered a superpower. Right. When I saw them and thought to myself, this is a third world country with an atomic bomb. <laughs> that sounds so you know? weird, but that's such a great way to put it. Yeah. yeah. And, um, then meeting the people, the Russian people, yeah. it was would totally blew me away. You know, Bill, Billy has a way with words, of course. He's a great songwriter. Yeah. And he wrote 
the song Leningrad, which is on Stormfront, on the Stormfront album. Yeah. And, and the whole idea of the song is we never knew what friends we had till we came to Leningrad because we were always told that these people want to bury us, they want to destroy us, they want to take over our, our t- side of the world. All we associate the people with the government picture that we're exactly. painted, right? E- exactly, exactly. Like, you know, there was a few times when we went overseas and, and we were like the ugly Americans coming in, the, in this, you know, I, I remember having this argument with this person and I was like, we're nothing like that. You think yeah. we're like that, but we're nothing like that. It's our government that's doing it, you know? We try to pick the right people to to make things right, but man, I don't know how we get the hard left going, you know? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. You know, what what was one of the best things you experienced there that isn't related to playing? What was it about the culture or food or something you did with some of the people there that you could tell us about? <laughs> one of one of the things that that sticks in my mind like uh, unbelievable was now it has to do with our food because we were told to bring stuff with us you know we brought pallets of water and and uh somebody brought a a little hot plate so you could cook in this room and stuff like that because they were like you know i don't know if you're gonna want to eat the food i ate everything everything that the russian people put in front of me I ate it. That and music I, is how you really experience a culture, the food and the music. Exactly. You sit down and break bread with somebody, yeah. you know what they're, they're about. Yeah. Yeah. But um, one of the, this woman, Elena, that I'm talking about, she was our guide and she came into my room to, uh, uh, before we were getting ready to go, right? And um, I had a jar of peanut butter and she was like, oh, this is peanut butter, huh? This is what the Americans are crazy about. Everybody loves peanut butter. Yeah. She tasted it and was disgusted by it. (laughs) She thought it was disgusting. Really? Oh, wow. She hated it. I actually moved my jar of peanut butter I keep right here. Because when I'm working, (laughs) I grab my thing of celery and I'm just dipping peanut butter, celery in the pit. It's like my day gets me through the day snack. That's so funny. Funny, I I just thought it was disgusting. Oh, you did peanut butter on crackers for my daughter. And then she decided to have some bag of chips or something like that. And I just finished off the crackers before we came on with the peanut butter. That's funny. It's all perspective, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I was surprised by the, the, the Soviet Union, which was called then. Right. And, uh, and, uh, you know, the way it was, but the people, the people, when we played there, they could not believe. And they said this to us. We can't believe that you came here to do this for us. Yeah. We can't believe it. And, you know, um, I, I told, uh, I mentioned something when we did the 25 years later, what, how it affected us and how uh, we affected them. Yeah. And, and, I, and I said, uh, you know, I went all American when, when we went there. I mean, I had flags on my uh, drum set and. You know, I was wearing Mickey Mouse pins and everything American. And Billy actually said, you got to tone it down, man. It's just too crazy. <laughs> but I didn't. You know, I said that Billy didn't want them to see the, the like where there's big, proud American and stuff like that. And the fellow that was doing the, the interview for the film, for the documentary after me was listening to what I was saying. And he was Russian. He was Billy's uh, interpreter. Oh. You know, he was on stage with Billy. And when Billy spoke, he told the Russian people what Billy was saying. He said to me, you know, because I had a shirt with an American flag on it and all, all kinds of stuff like that. He said to me, he goes, no, when the Russian people looked at you and your arms were going crazy and you were playing those drums the way you were played, they saw what freedom is actually like because you are able to do whatever you want. We are in a box. And we can't break out of that freedom. Yeah. He said, if you ever come to go to Russia to do drum clinics, you need, we have great musicians there, but nobody knows how to improvise because they can't step out of the box. They have to stay in the box. Oh, wow. Their imagination and creativity is thwarted from that whole societal uh, box yeah. that they've been put in and taught how to and how not to grow up. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. Wow. So he took that as a totally acceptable representation whereas i understand 
that Billy was worried about it being too overt and too much in their face, but it didn't come across to them that way, which is really a no. beautiful thing. Yeah. They, they, when we first started, I mean, the first show, uh, they had the Russian um, police guards, whatever they were, in, in the crowd. I mean, anytime anybody stood up, they pushed them down in the seats. Wow. And they were filming it. And, you know, they were filming yeah. the shows. Remember that. So the, the lights would go on to make the film nice, and the people would, the, the guards would see the people stand up, and they pushed them back down in the seats. That's when Billy said, you're ruining my show, and he flipped the piano over yeah. to get their attention, you know. But by the end, you know, when we got to Leningrad and by the end of Moscow, Moscow was first and then Leningrad was next. Um, by the time we got there, we, the soldiers were on the stage with us, twirling their hats, throwing them off the stage and stuff like that. We took home uniforms from soldiers and stuff. What? It, was, it was crazy. But they kept doing this to us, like this, doing this, like, because they had nothing to give us except this. Oh, yeah. From the heart? You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. so neat. Yeah. And how we are where we are in this world now, I just will never understand. It's just crazy. It's it's the leaders. You're absolutely you're absolutely right when you say it's the government. Uh, yeah, my the super in the building I live in is, is from Ukraine. And he still has uh, you know, his family still there and stuff like that. And and he keeps telling me it's insane. It's insane what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, you know. There's two I mean, young... you, you, you Ukraine had how many how many years of freedom, oh, you know, yeah. and once you get a taste of that, you don't want to go back oh, to the way yeah. it was. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's two young boys that we've been featuring on Drum Talk TV because we post videos from our fans uh, for probably the last five years. If I remember right, I think they're probably 12 and 17 now or 14 and 17. Daniel is mm -hmm. the older one. Ilya is the younger brother. Um, if I remember correctly, their last name is pronounced Volumev, or I think there's an extra syllable, but they're in Ukraine, they're in Kiev, and they yeah. message me through Facebook from time to time just to let me know how they're doing. And, and then when I see what's going on the news and think, oh my gosh, that's my, where my dad's dad, my grandpa was walking those streets. That's where these boys are now going through yeah. all this. It's just heartbreaking. I can't imagine going through this. You know, we're here in this country insulated from everything we've seen growing up in the news pearl harbor is really the closest thing that's ever and i don't think any of us alive went through that but it's the no. closest thing to us being attacked in during a war you know we're not having missiles going into apartment buildings and it's it's so surreal that i think it's really hard for people to relate to what other people could possibly be experiencing especially young boys like that no, I mean, I, somebody wrote on Facebook, this is what I went off on, somebody was, they wrote on Facebook, they go, well, half you people don't even know where the Ukraine is on the map. What about gas prices? What about the, it's like, dude, what are you talking about gas, gas prices? Right. What are you, what's wrong with you? Yeah. These people are fighting for their lives and their country yeah. and their culture and everything. Yeah. You worried about gas prices? Exactly. It's, no. a, it's a shame. It's just, uh, well, back he, def to he, de he definitely has put us in a, in a uh, uh, catch-22, though, because it's like, we can go in there and, and yeah. you know, it would be over. But then he's crazy enough to stop World War III. Right. You know, and then China, he's got on his side. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. It's a delicate situation. It's, it is crazy. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully uh, Biden will handle it like with the way Kennedy handled the, uh, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis. You yeah. Know? I mean, that took guts to, to tell him, hey, turn it around or you're going to get it. You know? Yeah. And it worked. It worked. It worked. Let's look so at what are we going to do? What yes. are we going to do? Yeah. Uh, play more music. Play more music. Play more music. Yeah. yeah. Let's look. Uh, and folks, and eat more. Yeah, eat exactly. More. When I look over here, folks, I'm not watching the Flintstones. I have our show up so I can see your comments. So chime in. Let us know where you're watching from. Here's a couple of comments. Lenny Smirowski in Cocoa Beach. Uh, we got China Hills, California from DS Waters. Hey, Joseph Mescalino says, hello, Liberty. Met you in Vegas in like 1990. Drum clinic you held at DePaulis Music was a great day. 
Rock on, my man. And I see he's uh, he's got dark hair. Do you remember him? <laughs> so that's I, had cool, write down, I had to write down your name. Yeah. <laughs> so I can remember while I'm talking. I had to write down my name. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool, Joseph, that, that that meant so much to you to bring it up so many years later. That's awesome. Hopefully you're still playing. Joseph, what did you learn at that clinic? I'd be curious to know and, and relay to yeah, Liberty. He's going to say, well. he's gonna say like, I, I'm a plumber now. I learned that you shouldn't play drums because <laughs> um, you're not going to make any money. I, I took up banjo after that clinic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <laughs> do, you, do you go to, now that things are opening up, do you go to local clubs out there in the Brooklyn area or Long Island area, anything to see? Bands I don't go out. I don't, I don't go out. <laughs> and have you always been like that? Like in uh, the yeah, last, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Only if I'm invited. Yeah. You, you know, and and being the age I am, you know, you asked me before about drummers of today that I thought uh, really, really, you know, I watched them like I used to watch the other guys. Yeah. And it's really sad what happened, you know, to Taylor Hawkins, but yeah. he was one of those drummers that that really was setting a pace. I went to see them. I met them because, um, you know, I got a phone call. They said, they want to meet you, they're fans, and uh, Taylor Hawkins wants to meet you. Dave Grohl has never met you. So I go to the gig and, and I, I mean, I met Dave Grohl, the first thing he said to me was like, I thought you'd be much bigger than you are the way you play the drums, mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, but Taylor Hawkins and me, you know, we became friends immediately. And, uh, you, you know, we used to text back and forth all the time. He, he, he sent me a, a, a video of, of him standing in front of a radio and you may be right, is playing in the background. He goes, remember when Billy Joe was really good? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it, it's really sad what happened. But when I went to see them, what impressed me the most was, like us with Billy's band, you, you play 110%. You give it all on the stage and you leave it there. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter that I'm, I'm going to go deaf if I keep it in the drums this much. I don't care. I'm yeah. giving it to you. All, all of it. You're getting all of me. And that's what the Foo Fighters did for me was like, wow, they're, they're one band that's really doing that. That's awesome. You know? oh. Yeah. They're not mailing yeah. it in. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. And this is when Dave Grohl had the cast on his leg. I remember that. Yeah. I've seen many videos from that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It was crazy. Wow. Crazy. Uh, yeah. What a shame that that happened. And I, I get upset when people um, bring in negative comments and discussions around substance abuse and addiction and things like that you know no no one's and i i don't know i never met taylor i don't know if he was an addict or not and i don't care it doesn't change my perception of him but you ever notice that no one's ever been yelled at and and shamed for having kidney disease or leukemia right. or any other disease but with alcoholism drug addiction there's just this, oh, you're a piece of shit because, you know, I, you don't, know, I, I it, don't know why there's it, such a societal impasse there. It's really funny. I was, it's funny, I'm, I'm going to be a name dropper now again. Uh, I you know, Paul McCartney to told me that Elvis told him that name dropping's rude. <laughs> oh, did I just do that? No. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I was talking to uh, Larry Mullen from U2. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, we were talking about uh, Taylor. And and his his thing was, didn't somebody see it and say something to him? Didn't anybody say something? You know what I mean? Right. Like, or, or were they just like, eh, you know, he'll get over it or, or or whatever it was? You know, did somebody say something? You know. Well, look at John Bonham. It's not yeah. like he was a closet drinker. No, you know, <laughs> it's out in the open. Yeah, yeah. and and. I ask myself that all the time, but we can't put that responsibility on those around him. We just can't. It's not right to do that. It's a valid no, question, but we can't hold others responsible. No. Uh, um, Anthony Bourdain, did you see the documentary? Oh, no, I didn't. Oh, I was a huge fan of his. I want to see that, that then. That poor man. I mean, you know, he had issues 
that tried to cover up, I guess. Yeah. I think people know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what's, I, what's I stick to you? <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's five stick five to A, use? actually. <laughs> five A. Yeah. How about you? Uh, I'm using five A's now. I used to use big logs, but then I started to get the like tinnitus and all yeah. that kind of bursitis. And, so I went to a lighter stick and it's uh, much better. And wood yeah. tip or nylon? Wood. And never, it, never went. I used to use the nylon, but the, not, the tips used to fly off. Oh, okay. I was going to ask if it was more for the sound or the feel. Because yeah. a lot of people say it's for sound, but I can't listen to an album and say, oh, he's using a nylon. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's very hard to tell. I don't know why people think they know, yeah. you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I can't tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, since we're on the subject of gear, let's talk about gear. What kind of heads have you used over the year? Have you years? Have you experimented with different things, or has it been something that worked and you've used it on all the albums? Did you use the same type of heads live as you did on the albums? Let's talk about that. Okay, you know it's funny uh, thinking of endorsements and yeah. why you get endorsements. Um, it's not only what can the company do for you but it's also what can you do for the company? If not more you so. Know? So, I mean, I mean, uh, being in Billy Joel's band and, and uh, representing a, a drum company is like a big deal because the name is up there and a lot yeah. of people see the, the Tom. I, I get uh, emails all the time. I bought my first Tama kit because you were using Tama at the time, you know, stuff like that. But uh, as far as heads go, I was using um, Remo for the longest time, mm -hmm. right? Then... Um, there was Canasonic. Do you remember Canasonic? Yeah, yeah. They, they actually made the, the the one that was used on the snare. I think Dad used to use it all the time. It's kind of flappy and dead. Yeah. You know, that was a Canasonic head. But Andy, the guy who owned the, the, the Canasonic, was making these uh, heads out of a special uh, space-age material that it wouldn't break. You could not break it until... It decided it wanted to go, then it would break. But they sounded great. Um, he, he couldn't get a, a, somebody to manufacture them. He wanted Remo or Evans or somebody else to do it. So I had to leave him, and I went to Evans. Mm -hmm. right. So my sound, the sound engineer for Billy, hated the Evans, and he and I said, "Why? Why do you hate live them? Because, or studio?" Live. Okay. He said, he said, I could tell you which one we're going to do this. We're going to, I was using four times up front, two floor times, right? He says, every other one put an Evans on and every other one, uh, you know, Remo Evans, Remo Evans, or, or whatever, or put them wherever you want. That's what he said. Put them wherever you want. And I will tell you from which the is front right. of the house, which one is the Evans and which one is the Remo. Nailed it. Nailed it. I told Remo, I said, uh, not Remo, Evans. I Evans, said, yeah. no, man, you can't do this. I, we can't use these anymore. You know? Yeah. They came, they, they came back with a drum head that is like killer. Really? Yeah. I mean, the G2 now is like, and the hydraulic. That's, so I that's hydraulic. when those came out. Wow. You know, it happened to Tama too. I remember uh, the foot pedals. You know, I, I was... Uh, this is back like in the early eighties and, and, and then, and uh, I, I was breaking the footboard, snapping it in half. And I understand Stuart Copeland was snapping him in half too. Um, so I had a DW pedal and DW had that brace on the bottom. Yeah. You know, you know? so at, at the time now, somebody had made me a custom snare drum. So, so now I'm using this uh, snare drum that somebody made for me. And now I'm using the pedal. Uh, a DW pedal, and the, the rep from Thomas says, "What are you going to do? Just play our toms eventually? You know, you're, you're playing a DW pedal now." And I said, "I tell you what, make me a pedal with a footboard. Uh, you know, with that that with the brace. sits on the floor to brace it. Yeah, and and I'll use the Thomas pedal. Boom. Then all of a sudden they started to make that. Yeah, you know. So it's like, you know, uh, using the gear." It's up to you, the drummer, to tell them what's wrong with it. 
or what's right with it. You know, right. I, I went with Tama uh, because they were the first ones when they had the extension, you know, the, the symbol stand extension. Yeah. They were the first ones to knurl it. Yeah. If that's not knurled for me and it's just smooth like a pearl one or something like that, yeah. I hit the symbol and, and, and it, the symbol just twists. flips. Yeah. 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 Because it's slick. For those who don't know, it's because it's slick. So there's not right. as much for the end of the screw that you tighten it with. Yeah. Right. There's no grip. Yeah. But the knurl, it grips. Yeah. That, I got those two back in. So mm -hmm. I have a two drum sets mm -hmm. that are set up right now. One's a small force piece like jazz kit and the other's a big monster kit with a gong and timpani drums and it's a combination of all the kits i had before this little black jazz kit and then in 83 i painted them all blue and the nucleus of that kit is from my second kit which was a 1979 tama imperial star that i got in 1979 and i had a red five piece 1970 pearl kit that i mixed in with it with two slingerland concert toms and the timpani drums but the hardware they've always had great hardware um yeah. and, and their drums are great too but the hardware is one of the biggest things that really differentiated them especially back then in the late 70s and i was interested in tama because you were playing tama and neil peart was playing tama at the time so i, yeah. I told uh, my parents i want to save up and get a tama drum set i have my liberty kit that i play with the lords and uh, you know they manufactured in in England, yeah. but I have Tama hardware on with with them. Yeah. Um, before people knew that Billy Cobham was going to go back to Tama, they invited him. It was one of the evenings of the Nam show in 2015 or 16, and uh, it was a Tama 40 year anniversary, if I remember correctly. And they invited him to play at it, which I thought was interesting because at the time he wasn't with Tama. But I had, I just had a feeling he was going to go back with him. And I interviewed him after the show or before the show. Before the show, I think it was, I interviewed him for the first time. And one of the things that he said was all about their hardware. Like he wanted to spill the beans, but he couldn't yet. But he just went on about how their hardware is just amazing. It's the best hardware. There. And I just had this feeling. And the next thing you know, he's back with Tom. And then I did two of his his first two mm -hmm. uh, Art of the Rhythm section retreats that we did in Mesa, Arizona. I hope I hope run those and film the documentary around them. And he had these yeah. beautiful Tom of drums now out of Babinga. So, yeah, beautiful. interesting. Cool. Yeah. Um, Can I just stick my head out the yeah. door to see how she's doing? Yeah, and I'm going to look at questions. I know we've got some great questions. Thanks, everybody, for chiming in. And I'm going to uh, ask all of these. Uh, Joseph, you're right. There should be nothing left in the tank. You know, going back to what you were saying about leaving everything on stage and just like they say in sports, leaving everything on the field. Um, right. Uh, Joseph Mascalino is saying there should be nothing left in the tank. Uh, Lenny Smirowski is asking, did you ever meet Ringo or Neil Peart? I never met Neil, but I did meet Ringo uh, twice, actually. Uh, the first time I met Ringo, and I mentioned this in my book, I, I shook his hand and I said, Ringo, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. And he looked at me and he said, well, at least you're not blaming me for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, and then Red, thanks for joining us. Oh, Rad, sorry. Rad Quartelis, I hope I got that right. He says, Billy Joel performed uh, for U.S. troops in Subic Bay, Philippines in 1990. Those troops were about to be deployed to the then Gulf War. I got one of Liberty's sticks that he threw to the audience after the show. That's cool. I love that people remember this stuff and it means so much to them, you know, um, um, me tell remember you that show? That, that gig, you know, uh, we, we had played in Japan and we were on our way to Australia and <clears throat> the USO flow flew us over there, uh, in a, a C five, I think it's called, the, the, yeah. you know, those planes that take all this gear and yeah. everything and that the wings are almost touching the ground when yeah. they're on the ground. One of those and all our gear, didn't even dent the plane, you know, it didn't, you know, we slept on, on rubber mats and, and uh, you know, we bought these uh, things that you float in a pool with, little rubber rafts, we slept yeah. on those on the flight over. And uh, while we were there, uh, the day 
that we played is when the Gulf War broke out. Oh, wow. And because we got there early, so we were, we were able to um, uh, uh, sit and, and talk to a lot of the guys and stuff like that. In, on Klux, uh, on um, Subic, we met a lot of the, the um, um, you know, the naval guys, uh, the, the um, guys that do the crazy stuff, you know, sneak up in the beach and slit somebody's throat in the back window. Uh, called, um, yeah. Uh, Sounds like a guitar player. Slip my mind. You know, we flew in. We flew in and we saw, you know, this this helicopter just hovering and uh oh the Navy SEALs. And and yeah. there's a string coming down from the helicopter and this these little blops on it, and it was guys just hanging on this rope. Yeah. You know? They they were taken out like I don't know how far into the ocean and dropped and they have to come come back. Yeah, you know. Yeah, crazy was, endurance. That was insane. And then uh, then we were on Clark's Air Force Base when the Gulf War did break out. Wow. The amount of firepower that we have is very impressive. Yeah. Very impressive. Jets just kept taking off all day. Just. It's hard to comprehend. Yeah. 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 Interesting memory. Uh, Lenny also says, I have a set of sticks from the original drummer from Johnny and the Hurricanes. Do you remember them? Oh, wow. Johnny sure. and the Hurricanes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Rubble cool. rouser. That's cool. Um, you, so you've been around the world. What's on your bucket list other than my house, what's on your bucket list of where you would want to go that you've never been to before? Place I've never been to. I would like to go to India because I want to see what it looks like. You know, yeah. I mean, it's so colorful. I see. I live in the in the the melting pot of the world. Yeah, all different cultures are here, and I I see. You know, uh, I I went on vacation to Africa and oh, I went on wow. safari. What I part? Climbed, uh, we went to we went to. Uh, Rwanda and saw the the mountain gorillas. We we climbed three and a half hours. To, I mean, you're you're like about twenty feet away from them, and they're they're right there. Just, wow, amazing! It was an amazing trip. My wife had always wanted to do it. She said, "Okay, let's go." You know, nice. it was before the little one was born. Since she's been born, we don't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. go you can anymore. hardly go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. And if I do, it's with her, and I have to. You know. <laughs> yeah. So India, but. Yeah. 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 I grew up in Los Angeles, kind of the same experience with so many cultures around. Um, and, and what's your favorite place you have been outside of the United States? I know it's hard to pick one, but what would be a notable one other well, than Russia that we talked about? Other than Russia, well, what would be a notable one and why? On gigs, the place that I loved to go most was Australia. Oh, yeah. I loved Australia. Yeah. I lived there for a little while, working with the charter yacht industry at a video production company. Australia is beautiful. Let me tell you something. The food is great. The the, the scenery is great. The, the beaches are wonderful. The girls were dying to get up to America. They would do anything to get there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you talk about the food. My wife came home before I did because she had stuff to do and I just kept getting more work. And I remember her, uh, we were talking on the phone or Skype and she said, I can't eat anything here. And I said, what do you mean? She said, the food is tasteless here compared to Australia. And I said, well, I said, that's because in America, our land is so stripped of minerals that the food is grown on. And even that the cattle is fed, unlike Australia, where it's still so rich in minerals and everything. Yeah. You walk into the produce department in a market in Australia, you smell the bananas, you smell the strawberries. And whereas here, it's like, yeah, it all smells like the grocery store. <laughs> and she couldn't eat anything for like a month. She had to reacclimate to that. And then I experienced that when I got back. Did you yeah. notice that? How different the food was because of the freshness and, and, and all of that? Well, I noticed how fresh the vodka was. And the vodka <laughs> <laughs> it's right out of the still. <laughs> Actually, in Russia, in Russia, uh, the vodka was like flowing free and, and it was just wonderful. But uh, they, they, one guy, one Russian guy, musician, was was like goggling with us. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that was to that was the to hide the uh, the aroma of his breath of the scope that he had earlier. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. 
No, Australia. I was impressed because I remember the Columbia Records, CBS, whatever they were at the time, uh, mm -hmm. taking us to these places where you you buy a steak and then you cook it yourself on the on the barbecue grill outside. Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, just fantastic, you know. Yeah, the it's seafood, a beautiful place. Unbelievable. I have cousins that live there from they're really? from Sicily oh, and wow. they live there. And I remember being in Sid Sydney and saying to my cousin, I want to go to the best Italian restaurant in Sydney. We get in the car, he takes us to his house. Oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Funny, we, we lived when we first got there in uh, Randwick, which is a part of Sydney, has a very Germanic influence. And at night we were walking down the street and uh, I said, gosh, I, I, I don't know why I'm craving Mexican food. And she looks across the street and says, there's a Mexican restaurant right there. I said, no way. We went, the owner had immigrated there from Mexico 22 years earlier. His whole family worked at the restaurant. He went around with a guitar, was serenading at tables. It was some of the best Mexican food I've ever had. And one of my ex-wives is from Mexico, so I know Mexican food. It was yeah. such an interesting thing to be somewhere where you don't expect it. But then again, why would it be different from here? This isn't Mexico. That's right. not Mexico. Right. That's funny that he took you to his house for the best Italian food. Best Italian food. Let's go. That's great. <laughs> hey, before we go, I got one more question for you. It's the Liberty DeVito fun fact question. Ready? Oh, God. When okay. you're not playing music, mm. what do you like to do? Do you, do you have any hobbies that are totally outside of music? I know you're raising a family. I know you'll probably say you love spending time with them, or maybe not. Not everyone likes spending time with their family. That's why we moved up to the mountains, but that's another story. But but do you have some sort of hobby or something completely away from music that you like spending your time doing? Well, you can talk about the family. And me and my wife, when we had May, you know, it was five now, uh, we said from the beginning that we are not going to get a nanny, you know, uh, I didn't have nannies for my other girls. And um, so I'm not getting a nanny for May. Uh, when I'm not playing, I will be with May. I have more mothers and nannies phone numbers in my, my, my phone now than I do like I rock stars. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, uh, um, uh, hi, Cheryl. Is is is, uh, is Lyra gonna play at the pl playground today? Okay, good. We'll meet you there. You know, oh, that's like, great. You know, so that that's really what I do. I mean, that's if I'm great. not playing music, you know, and not in a studio or something like that, I am with May. That's she's great. right out there. I just went to check on her. Yeah. She's sitting there with a piece of pita bread and <laughs> she's got a bag of chips opened up, <laughs> watching nice. Sesame Street. Perfect. Perfect. Liberty, yeah. thank you for coming on again. And thanks for really such a wonderful book that not only talks about your life, but really deconstructs every song of every album you did with Billy Joel. And just the anecdotes and the stories and the history in here is very enriching. And I mean enriching, folks. If you really want to learn from other people's experiences and perspectives, this is a great book to do that. You can get it on HudsonMusic.com. Liberty, thanks again. Hang on the line with me for a moment after we say goodbye. And folks, thank you so much. I will send the link to the archive of this to Liberty. And Liberty, maybe some other questions will pop up after it's archived. You can cruise through and see if there's anything you want to answer and just say hi to people. Sure. Great. Great. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye.